Hello, and welcome to the Legal Helm Podcast, the show where we talk all things legal tech. We've got a really fascinating episode for you today with Nathan Walter, CEO of BriefPoint, a platform to facilitate end-to-end litigation document automation. Nathan and Bim discuss how lawyers can better serve their clients by doing less. They also talk about fractals, video games, and why big law needs to be cognizant of smaller firms going forward. And now, on to the show. Hello, Legal Helm listeners. Today on our show, we are talking with Nate Walter, CEO and co-founder of BriefPoint a platform that facilitates end-to-end litigation document automation. Today's topic is really around litigation lawyers and how they can benefit from legal technology solutions, but also talking about legal technology generally. So Nate, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking time out to talk to me today. You've had a very interesting journey in terms of your path to getting to BriefPoint, and I'd love for you to just walk us through your journey so far. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what I've heard through the grapevine around some comedy that might be in there, some stand-up comedy. So please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up to the point that you are now at Breakpoint. Sure. And just let me say thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of Legal Helm and it's a, it's a huge honor to be here talking with you today, Ben. But as far as my journey, I started off at UCLA Law and yeah, I, I was doing stand-up comedy at the same time I was doing law school. I was an open micer, so I, was, I would never consider myself a stand-up comic. I was just doing open mics. I was getting paid sometimes, but it was not a, a career. That's incredibly difficult. You have to make a ton of sacrifices to do that. I was really interested in doing public defense. And I ultimately clerked with the DA's hardcore gang unit in Los Angeles County. And it was just way too intense for me. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the people that can do that, but I wasn't strong enough for that. You know, I always kind of was interested in tech and I was researching where to go. So I ended up in Buckalter's Orange County office. They had an aviation and aerospace litigation department. And we dealt with drone technology, which at the time, everyone was really excited about it. Amazon had their drone delivery service in full operation. There was Larry Page's Kitty Hawk that was talking about creating urban air mobility grids, which is like a taxi system of drones carrying people above the street, but below the commercial airlines. And it was a really exciting time. I did that for a few years. And then I went to do mega project construction litigation at Watt Teeter Hoffer Fitzgerald, also in Orange County. And throughout that time, I actually just fell in to legal tech and it's a little silly. So there's There's a long version of the story, and then there's a short version of the story that I'll tell like potential investors, but I have you here. So if you don't mind, I'll start from like the origins, I suppose. It started with like a kind of silly observation. I was drafting a brief and I started to realize that there was this common IRAC formula or issue rule analysis conclusion. And this is a structure for drafting persuasive writing. And it's where you identify the issue, then you state the statement of law, then you apply the law to the facts, and then you conclude that that relationship should result in a favorable ruling or order for your client. And I was reading this brief and I sort of saw this pattern in the paper because you have an introduction, you have the statement of law, you have the legal analysis and the conclusion. And then I also saw that in the sections of those different, like bigger chapters. And then I saw the same pattern in the smaller paragraphs. And then even in in the sentences or the grammatic structure sort of followed this same pattern. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if there's any writing on patterns in legal drafting. And that led me to Andrew Stumpf from University of Michigan, I believe. And I may be getting that wrong his article on the law as a fractal. And a fractal is a self-repeating pattern, agnostic a scope. So no matter how far you zoom in or out, it's the similar pattern. That's a self-repeating fractal. It's just an infinitely complex shape, effectively. I was really fascinated by that because it was a cross-section of math and law that I hadn't seen before. And I thought that if we can capture these infinitely complex shapes, then with a model, with a formula, as we do with fractals, then maybe we could capture the application of law with some sort of formula. So if we can model fractals or geometric shapes with infinitely complex edges, then maybe we can model 
law, which has a policy application to a potentially infinitely complex factual data set. So like every personal injury case is different. You apply the same underlying laws, but the actual facts are different. Similarly, a little formula can capture a shape and apply this rule. That's the rule and it applies in an infinitely complex manner. So I thought that would be really interesting to think about. And that's when I started thinking about legal tech and how technology and maybe advanced AI systems might be able to actually capture application of law and argumentation, which is the application of a policy to, again, a potentially infinitely complex data set. From there, I worked back and this thought was in my mind. I said, okay, well, we might be able to effectively automate some very complex things in litigation, which is a legal application. And it drove me crazy because I would routinely have to advise my clients that this is related. I promise. I would routinely have to advise my clients that they might need to settle this case because it would be cheaper to pay the other side than to continue fighting on account of predominantly legal fees. That is to say, the amount of time it would take me or my firm to represent them and defend them would cost them more than the amount that the person was suing them for. So even if they hadn't done anything wrong, if they're a business, you know, they need to be business oriented, it's probably the best move for them just to pay them. And you go to law school and, you know, I had this experience, wanted to be a public defender in, in the criminal justice system and all that. It bugged me because we're taught to surface justice. We're supposed to be officers of the court that surface justice and to be the mechanism that ultimately results in people paying other people by no other reason than they're suing them, people that hadn't done anything wrong, it really bugged me. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to draft an AI system to replace a judge effectively. So I've taken a step back from that. I thought maybe I'll teach myself some coding and see if I can automate some of the more rote tasks, the repetitive tasks. And I already had experience in the AI backside of legal document review with the technology assisted review programs, which is sort of like supervised machine learning. And I then started to teach myself Python. I have this book here, Python for Dummies. The actual title is how to automate the boring stuff with Python. And I started reading that. And then I took some online courses for a few months and I got access to some of these new natural language processing, which is a type of AI, frankly. And I theorized that I could combine some of these natural language processing modules, some of the newest ones, with the technology assisted review systems from AI document review to create a platform that would take documents and then draft responses in a very short amount of time, which would then free up my client's litigation budget so that we could fight for a longer period of time so that there would be less of an incentive to settle the case. And it would also make my life a lot easier because I wouldn't have to stay up all night on a Friday drafting a discovery response when all my friends are at a wedding or something, you know? So that was it. And I, I then left that firm and I started making these vaporware programs because I wanted to establish product market fit. So I knew the underlying tech that I wanted to use for my startup. And so I created in Adobe XD, all of these fake programs, and these were all smoke and mirrors, but I made the program look like a desktop computer. So it had all the icons and stuff. And I would call people, I'd cold call people and pretend to be selling these products. And I would try to get them on a demo to get their feedback on it. I'd say, okay, I'm charging this. Would you pay for this? And they'd say yes or no. And attorneys are pretty forthright. So they would tell me no. And I was very lucky for that, a candid feedback. And I would show them in this fake program. And then I, from those iterations, I then came to BriefPoint's first module, which is we take a discovery request document, a PDF, and then it generates a discovery response, right? I'm not a senior engineer. I couldn't code this thing. I needed a CTO, a technical co-founder with me. And I had been interviewing people online and it hadn't been going well. And I had this gaming, this video game community that I had created for young professionals. And I created it because I moved to a new city, didn't know anyone. So I said, you know what? I'm going to fabricate a social life through, through video games. So I bought a PlayStation 4 and I put it in my studio apartment and I started recruiting young professionals to play video games with. And we had about 816 members at our peak. And I posted in our community's board. I said, hey, I know this is a huge shot in the dark. I'm starting this legal tech company. Does anyone know how to code better than writing hello world? <laughs> like the first line that everyone learns. 
And I got a response from my now CTO and he says, hey, I have 10 years of experience. I'm a lead engineer at Relativity and I've been doing legal tech coding for a long time. And I actually have a team of designers and backend and front end engineers that I worked with on a startup before and they'll join me and we'll do this together. And so I brought on a machine learning guy I recruited and he brought on his team and we hit the ground running, designing and creating BriefPoint. That is fantastic, Nate. Thank you for sharing that. There were so many things that we could take away from what you've just described, actually. I've been in kind of legal technology space for longer than I care to remember, to be honest with you. But I've seen so many products that start with really an idea of what could be a solution to a problem, right? And I think what you've just described is exactly the way that all software should really evolve, which is you started with a problem, you saw the challenge, and then you connected the technology to the challenge. You found a way of being able to solve that problem in a different way, a more efficient way, and then brought that to market. And I also love the way that you tested the market as well, because ultimately, even with a great idea, it doesn't always work the way that we want it to work, right? So it's always great to be able to test the market and understand, you know, which route you should take. So that, that was really, really helpful to understand your journey and mindset. So I really appreciate you sharing that. So you kind of touched on BriefPoint and really the problem that BriefPoint solves. Tell us a little bit more about the products, the platform, what's involved in terms of getting it up and running and how quickly can somebody adopt a product like this? In minutes. In fact, during our demos, I don't even share my screen. I just have the attorney use BriefPoint in full feature right in front of me. And I say, there it is. You've done it. You know, Colin Levy was on the podcast recently and He's amazing. And he talked about user centric design. And I think that's important. And I take it a step further and I say brutally simple design, like brutally simple. And so for brief point, all you need to do is drag and drop a PDF onto the website. You can do it right now. We allow everyone to use a full feature product for free. You drag a discovery request PDF onto the website. You can even forward it to our email. And then you just, you select a few things and then out pops a response. And there's no onboarding time. There's no implementation process. You just do it. And this is something that I see in B2C experiences all the time. You don't need a computer science degree to find a playlist in Spotify. And in fact, Spotify doesn't even have tutorials. Google doesn't have a tutorial. You type in something, you hit enter, and some of the most advanced AI in the world works to give you those answers. So the real force of our technology is actually guided to simplify use. And that's where all the heavy lifting happens. And well, a lot of it, there's obviously parsing documents, which is complicated too, but we really wanted to make it brutally simple in a way that just looks and feels like a B2C experience. That's a part of our philosophy. It's technically a B2B company, but we're selling it as if it's B2C. You can cancel on the website, there's no sales process. We don't need to do a demo if you don't want. And that also in involves the incredible uh, focus on simplicity of use. I totally agree. Like simplicity is key. And if you have to explain how to use a product, then fundamentally that may be where we're failing. So it's great that it's as simple to use and that the, the kind of initiation time to actually getting the value from the product is so short, right? Because that's also some of the challenges that we see, particularly with other products in the market that can take a long time to implement. I think one of the things that I kind of wanted to also get your take on is just earlier this week, actually, I was meeting with a client law firm, pretty sophisticated law firm from a technology perspective, have current systems and do a reasonable job of implementing technology that makes sense for the business. And when I asked them about some of their processes, we were particularly talking about billing processes. A lot of the stuff that they were doing was very manual still, right? So they had all of the kind of workflow infrastructure to make things very easy from an approval perspective. But when we actually looked at what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, it was secretary printing out a whole bunch of paper, organizing it into piles of invoices in particular value order, and then literally handing that off to a partner to go and review, mark up, and then hand back. And still surprises me today that we're in this position where this kind of paper trail is still there. But I wanted to get your take and really for our audience to hear the answer from you as to why should lawyers care about technology, right? Because sometimes we talk to lawyers and they'll come to us and say, you know, my process at the moment works, right? So I don't need to change anything. So I'd love to hear from you as to why should lawyers care about technology? Well, there's a couple reasons. The first reason is there's a whole cohort 
of younger attorneys who are starting their own firms with technology first. And they're going to be able to offer much cheaper representation, much faster, and frankly, much better in the long term. And you're going to lose clients to those people once they figure out how to reach out to your clients. So that's the number one thing. Like this is happening. I work with solo and small practitioners who went out to create this thing and they say, you know what? I want an automated practice. I want to do this quick. And they use BriePoint to do that as part of their tech stack. And that's not going anywhere. That's only going to get more popular. And those people are going to start taking clients. And, and Big Law knows this. And that's reflected by the innovation leads positions that you're seeing in a lot of the big law all, all across the, the world, I would imagine. The other thing is quality of life for your associates and paralegals. There is a huge war for talent going on right now. One in four associates quit their jobs last year. In the UK, I know 86% of law firms face billing pressure to lower their bills. There's a lot of market pressure on firms to innovate and it's coming from the clients and it's coming internally from the associates who are getting burnt out and who are looking at their friends from college who work at Google and seeing this amazing work-life balance and wondering why they're getting paid twice as much to do half the work. But the writing's been on the wall for a while. And I think we're now at a point where the technology is getting to a place where it doesn't require attorneys to change how they work to innovate their practice. And this is something that I think about a lot. And it's just looking at what does an attorney do already? We, we cut the attorney workflow into a cross section and there's a timeline of events. And we pick out which things that we can automate reliably given the current state of tech. And we automate that all in one place. But what we don't do is we don't change the order. We don't skip steps. It automates the steps, but the steps are taken care of. And we map it out to how the attorneys already work. And that's just going to become more and more prevalent. So if an attorney it sends something to his secretary for some billing procedure that's a manual, a successful company, I would imagine, would just capture that send. So he sends the email. So he's not doing any more or less work, but he sends the email to his secretary. And then immediately he gets back a whole billing report, right? So it's just about from the attorney's perspective, you want to make sure that you're not requiring them to change too much. And I think people complain about law firms being archaic and slow to adopt. And that's why legal tech companies die so frequently is because of slow adoption rates. So you really need to be cognizant of that. And I think that technology can be used to actually mirror the attorney workflows in a manner that's not disruptive in a negative way. You make a, a great point, like the innovation that's happening within the legal technology space at the moment is fantastic, right? Because you can see some really good solutions coming to market. You've got an example in brief point. What to you is, is standing out from the crowd in terms of technologies that are really exciting you at the moment? Have you seen anything recently that you're thinking, wow, this is really taking us to the next level and you've got a level of excitement about? Absolutely. I'm really excited about just legal tech generally. Ironclad is a huge company. I mean, not a huge, but I mean, it's, it's a big company relative to most legal technology companies. And I know they don't like being called legal tech because they're used by business users, but I really like Ironclad because they stand by ease of use and they're all about the workflow and they think really carefully about what a transactional attorney does for a company. And then they bring that all into one platform. So what I'm excited about is unification of platforms, is bringing all these services into one place. I know at Iltacon, there was a lot of talk about platform fatigue. And I think that we're going to see more and more really big players or big groups of startups starting to clump together to facilitate end-to-end -end automation within certain processes in law. And I think that's really exciting because at its logical conclusion, in the case of litigation and what I want to do with BriefPoint, the practice of law is it's just so much better when you don't need to worry about attention to detail, when you don't need to worry about spending hours on some rote task. The biggest challenge is being a creative argumentator in this world of automation and end-to-end -end automation. The biggest challenge is being a creative thinker in law and coming up with really clever arguments. And then once you have those, that's the heavy lifting now. And then you just express your intent into this platform or whatever it happens to be. And then your intent is realized in a brief that you would have otherwise had to spend the next several weeks grinding out. And you could have the best legal argument in the world if your citations aren't uniform, or you have spelling errors, or you change the plaintiff's name halfway through the paper, if you're an associate, you're going to get roasted. 
your paper's going to get back and it's going to be dripping red ink on the floor. And that's a shame because there's some really creative litigators out there that don't succeed in law because the attention to detail is such a, such a difficult thing for a lot of people because it, it's a muscle and it's exhausting to do it for long periods of time, but you have to, and it has to be perfect all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. There's definitely some exciting times ahead in terms of how we can change the dynamic, right? And I, I mean, this is a great platform to talk about this kind of stuff because I think there's a lot of learning nuggets for me and the audience. So appreciate your input there. So for people that may be in the legal space, like practicing law or working in other departments in a law firm that has an appreciation of technology, want to get involved in the legal technology space. But you've made that transition from being a litigator all the way through to being a legal technologist now. What would you recommend as a path to success there? And how does one get started to start to dabble in the technology side? I know you mentioned that you, you bought your Python for Dummies books to get you started. Is that what you would recommend for people like to go start reading up on some of the technology areas or how do we start that path and that journey? So I talk to attorneys all the time that want to get into legal tech. And if anyone listening would like to talk to me about that, you can find me on LinkedIn. I, I'm always happy to praise the good word of legal tech and, and help people out and brainstorm. So some things I think, you know, engineering is not for everyone. I will say that attorneys will make incredible engineers because if you have attention to detail at the beginning, you're going to do a lot less bug smashing at the end. So it'll save you time and your, your project manager will be very happy with you. And I've seen a lot of success in there. But you don't even need to go that far necessarily. I think that if you look at a lot of the growing legal tech companies, they have a whole bunch of JDs in their company that are doing all sorts of things. And it may be just shifting your mindset a little bit from my identity is a litigator or an attorney to my identity is a hypercritical analyzer or something. Like I have these skills that can be applied over all sorts of careers. And, you know, I love coding personally, but sales is also something. If you want to get into sales or customer success, I mean, you can talk to attorneys and having a JD or an experience as an attorney, you can sell better to attorneys. Legal engineering is in a very exciting role. And frankly, you don't even necessarily need to know coding to be a legal engineer. It's not a huge opportunity market out there. There's not a lot of positions, but it's a growing position base. And if there is an opportunity there, you can be a legal engineer. What a legal engineer does by way of background is they do some of the coding that requires legal analysis in the coding. So for example, I was up until like midnight last night coding a, a new form interrogatory type for California. So I'm writing in all the requests and then adding these different modules that are all necessarily linked to the actual law. Uh, and that is strictly for legal technology companies predominantly. So legal engineering is another path. But really at the end of the day, leaving the law is much harder than people give it credit for it. I think it's very difficult because you go to law school and you, it really becomes part of your identity and leaving law to do anything else. You have to be brave to do that. You have to say, well, you know, I've invested all this money. Hopefully you're not in too much debt, but you could be in debt. You know, I am a lawyer and the nature of practice of law, you have to give everything to it really to, to be successful and leaving that's very hard, but I would just encourage anyone that's thinking about it. Like everything's going to be okay. There's plenty of opportunities. And at the end of the day, you are an incredibly effective person. And that's, that's really what you should focus on. Fantastic. Some great advice there. Thank you for sharing that. I want to move to my final few rapid fire questions for you, if you don't mind. The first is the question I ask everybody, which I love hearing answers to is if you could borrow Dr. Who's time machine and you could go back to Nate at 18 years old, what advice would you give him? Whew. Oh boy. It's so hard to answer this question because I believe that my experiences have really honed my current character. So I feel like I'd be committing some sort of character suicide if I changed my path. But ignoring that, I would probably say, I don't know, I guess I, I would, I would tell him something that was told to me and that I didn't listen to. And that was like, everything's going to be fine. Like you yeah, just keep working. I probably stressed way too much during that time and in my twenties and people have told me this, said, listen, everything's going to be fine. I didn't listen to them. And I, I so maybe if I, appeared in front of my 18 year old self in a phone booth and popped out and smoke poured out of the door. Maybe I would listen to him then. Excellent. And if somebody is late to the gaming world and doesn't have a gaming console, what should they buy? 
So that's, that's such a funny question. I'm a PlayStation guy. So if you can get your hands on a PlayStation 5, that's a great place to start. You want to start with things. If you have a partner or a friend, you I think It Takes Two is a great game to start. Rocket League is an easy game to pick up. There's a ton of games that you can pick up very quickly, and they'll teach you the fundamentals of maneuvering your whatever character you have with the joysticks and all the buttons and stuff. And you can have a lot of fun with those, even though you're not good. And I'm bad at most video games, and I still enjoy it. Any thoughts on or any experience with the VR games, like the Oculus? I'm, I'm really interested in it. We're a bootstrap company, so I don't really have the extra funds. I've used a VR in an arena, so there's like, a store at a strip mall and you go into a boxing ring and put on a headset and that was wild it was very impressive it was a lot of fun yes our, our producer has also enticed me to do the same thing so I'm, i think that's probably going to be my next purchase any questions that you wish i would have asked that i didn't today no i think we covered everything you know it's just been a pleasure talking to you and i, and I appreciate it. i think all the questions were incredibly thoughtful and i'm, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity it's actually been really insightful, so really happy that you were able to join us today and share some of your wisdom and share a little bit about your product. If anybody does want to get in touch with you, Nate, what's the best way to reach you? Find me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, that's Nathan Walter, and you can shoot me an in-mail or you can send me a connection request with a little note, and I'm usually pretty good about that. Thank you, Nate. And just a final thank you to all of my audience and listeners that have stuck with us all this time. We really appreciate you listening in to us and I hope you've got some valuable nuggets and takeaways from us speaking to Nate today. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Legal Helm. Thank you as always for listening. We really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us out and lets us keep doing the show. See you next time on The Legal Helm.